Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fourth and final. No, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's right. I see it up there. I see it now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final event of the Reimagining Public Health for New York City, especially until we pick up again in the fall. Um, my name is Torian Easterling, and I am the first Deputy Commissioner and Chief Equity Officer at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And I am certainly pleased to be one of the moderators for tonight's event, along with my colleague, Dr. Michelle Morse, Chief Medical Officer and Deputy Commissioner for the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness. Over the past three months of this series, we have discussed topics and concepts relating to vaccine trustworthiness, collective recovery, and healing, and building around narrative power. We have been able to bring together tremendous leaders, advocates, and change agents to listen to ideas, deepen thoughts around strategies, and open up to audience questions and interests. These conversations are reaffirming that the pathway to health equity and justice cannot happen without a deep regard and acknowledgement of what has been done and has been lost and what needs to change. Tonight's conversation, liberation and reckoning for health justice will deepen that insight in how we can inform the work that lies ahead. We are looking forward to the conversation uh, and certainly really excited about uh, our, our panelists who have joined us this evening. But first, uh, I am excited to introduce someone who I admire very much, our First Lady of New York City. As the First Lady of New York City, Charlene McRae has redefined the role of First Lady and managed a robust portfolio. She is nationally recognized as a powerful champion for mental health reform and has been named a 2019 World Health Organization champion. First Lady McRae created the Office of Community Mental Health, which is formerly known as Thrive NYC, which has been the most comprehensive health plan in any city or state in this nation. In addition to her role in leading and being a mental health champion, she also leads our City's Thrive Coalition, chairs the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, and co-chairs the New York City Commission on Gender Equity and Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity. And without further ado, I'd like to bring to our virtual stage, our First Lady. Good evening, everyone. And Thank you, Dr. Easterling, for that introduction and all you do to fight for health justice and equity. I've really enjoyed seeing your commitment to our communities firsthand. Dr. Choksi, Dr. Morrison, everyone in the health department, thank you for your perseverance throughout too many long, painful days and nights. Your work has kept New Yorkers safe, informed, and saved lives. It's exciting to be here with all of you. I don't think I've ever spent time with so many doctors outside of a hospital. And I have to say, it's refreshing. And it's fitting that we're having this conversation just a few days after Juneteenth, at a time when most people are talking about the path to normal. The theme tonight is liberation. We don't want life to go back to normal. We want more and we want better. And that's what this series of talks, Reimagining Mental Health in New York City is, is, is all about. Dismantling racism, bringing justice to our communities, it won't happen overnight, but we've proven again and again that we can make significant progress. The kind of conversations we're having, the kind of organizations and coalitions we're forming are all part of the healing. A friend of mine often says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We must go far. We have to work together in ways we have not traditionally been able to. At the beginning of this year, New York City made our task force on racial inclusion and equity permanent because we know the problems exacerbated by COVID won't dissipate if we continue with business as usual. Task force members are primarily people of color, senior leaders who know how to wield the levers of power in government, and many were born lived or worked in these communities. They have worked in common purpose, not only surveying the structural inequities communities of color have experienced in their own words, but by creating new policies and redirecting resources. For example, the task force has a plan in place to bring reliable broadband to thousands of households that didn't have it before. 
That allows for telemedicine, easier access to primary care, access to employment. We're training people in communities of color to provide mental health support and connect people who need it to ongoing care. And we're going even further to support our children in fall, in school this fall. In addition to academic screening, every student will have a social emotional screening as well so they can receive the personal support they need. So I have to tell you all, last week I was at PS78 in Staten Island where I met a child who had worked on this beautiful rainbow banner to welcome the chancellor and me. And then later I learned that this child had recently lost a parent. And I watched a class of third graders, mostly students of color, talk about how they handle difficult emotions, asking questions like, how do I cope when I'm feeling sad? Or how would I process, um, how would I process my frustration in a, in, a, in a healthy way? In that classroom, they trusted their feelings and each other. And just imagine if we, we all had those skills when we were seven years old or, or younger. Those, those lessons are, are changing their lives right now and providing them with skills they will use throughout their lives. Hearing those squeaky but earnest voices brought tears to my eyes. And later, as I talked to the principal, the chancellor, uh, teachers and parents, and, and even the reporter who was present, I realized that, that I was not the only one. Everyone was moved by this curriculum and what was happening, even the reporter. So this is a new era we are beginning and every one of us has to play a role. So these conversations you are having will help our families, help build a family, help build a city uh, where, where people feel safe, supported and healthy and able to live their best lives. I appreciate every single one of you participating in, in this series, and I thank you all. I can't wait to hear more from our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, First Lady, for joining us. Thank you for your time and your commitment uh, to equity, to racial justice, uh, and certainly your leadership. Um, and so just to move our program along, at this time, I would like to bring to our virtual stage uh, the first Corinthian Baptist Choir Ensemble, who will set the stage and bring a rend rendition. Lift every voice, 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 and voice and sing to let the Silence, tears. God of our silence, tears. Thou who has 
from the places our God where we wonderful way uh, to open up tonight's event. Thank you so much to the First Corinthian Baptist worship team for that rendition of Lift Every Voice and Sing by two awesome, amazing American composers, uh, James Weldon Johnson and Jay Rosamond Johnson. And I think it is so fitting as we engage in this dialogue of liberation and reckoning with health equity and health justice. Um, and so it is uh, it rarely important uh, that we uh, uh, provide this land acknowledgement before introducing uh, our panelists. And so with that, I want to make sure that we are acknowledging that we are gathered on the unceded territory of the Lenape, Merrick, Canarsie, Rockaway, Manticoc, and all the saucy people, I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations, and honor with gratitude the land itself. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. We also acknowledge that Black, Indigenous, and people of color continue to experience and resist the daily impact and reality of years of disinvestment, racism, bias treatment, and oppression. And we are committed to working in partnership with community stakeholders, taking action to eliminate inequities, and protecting and promoting the health of all New Yorkers, like the one happening this evening. This work is really important, and the conversation that we're about to embark, embark on takes courage, but it also takes uh, really bold action to be uncomfortable and make sure that we're having authentic conversations. And so with that, I would like to bring our, our awesome panel to this virtual stage. First, let me bring up Lillianne Payne. Lillianne is a Director for Technical Assistance and Business Development for the National Birth Equity Collaborative, who we have worked with uh, a lot over the years in really addressing uh, black and brown maternal health inequities in New York City. And so really happy to have Lillian join us. Lillian in her previous role as chief of staff with the city of Milwaukee's health department uh, really was instrumental in authoring the Wisconsin's Public Health Association, Racism is a Public Health Crisis 2018 Resolution. And she, she facilitated the resolution adoption in Milwaukee which marked the first municipality to do so. Welcome, Lillian. Second, I'd like to bring, bring on um, Brother Marlon Peterson. Marlon is an author, host of a podcast, Atlantic Fellow for the Racial Equity and Social Justice Leader. Marlon is the host of the Decarcerated Podcast. Marlon recently uh, uh, just authored a published book, Bird Uncaged, an abolitionist freedom song, uh, and his Ebony Magazine has named him one of America's 100 most influential and inspiring leaders in the Black community. Welcome, Marlon. Next up, I would like to introduce, uh, and I'm sure this person doesn't really need an introduction, uh, Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones. Dr. Jones is a family physician, an epidemiologist, and leader in the public health field. Dr. Jones' work has focused on naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism in health on health and well-being. Um, she hopes that through her work to initiate a national conversation on racism that will eventually lead to a national campaign against racism. Dr. Jones is currently an adjunct associate professor at both the Morehouse School of Medicine and the Rollins School of Public Health. D welcome, Dr. Jones. 
Thank Next, you. I would like to introduce uh, Ted Kerr. Ted is a Canadian-born, Brooklyn-based writer, organizer, and artist whose work focuses on HIV, AIDS, community, and culture. Ted's work has been published in numerous books and magazines, and in 2016, Ted won the Best Journalism Award from Paz Magazine for his hyperallergic article on race, HIV, and art. Currently, Ted te teaches at the New School. Ted is also a founding member of the What Would an HIV Doula Do? Collective, a community of people committed, committed to better implicating community within the ongoing response to HIV and AIDS. Welcome, Ted. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Morningstar Gali. Morningstar is a member of the Pitt River Tribe located in Northeastern California. Uh, Morningstar serves as a project director for restoring justice for indigenous people and as the California Tribal and Community Liaison for the International Indian Treaty Council. Morningstar is a 2019 Open Society Institute Racial Equity Fellow, a Funders for Justice Fellow in 2018 and 2021, and a Rosenberg Foundation Leading Edge Fellow focusing on the disproportionate impact of the criminal and juvenile justice systems on Native Americans. I'd like to welcome all of our panelists uh, to this virtual stage. Thank you so much, all of you, for being with us uh, this, this evening. And so to get us started, I'm going to uh, pose some questions to all of our panelists, uh, and, and then we'll get into some dialogue later, and I would like to then welcome uh, my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Morris, uh, to the stage at that time. But first, let us get into some questions. So first question to Dr. Jones. Dr. Jones, um, do you have any allegories or framing uh, that can situate us uh, this evening as we begin the discussion around the concepts of liberation and reckoning for health justice? Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Easterling, for that question. And indeed, I do. <laughs> so I... Um, my work, as you said, focuses on naming, measuring, and addressing the impacts of racism on the health and well-being of the nation. And I focus there because we have to, uh, because racism is foundational in our nation's history, Col you know, settler colonialism is an aspect of that. And yet many people are in staunch denial of its continued existence and profoundly negative impacts on the health and well-being of the nation. There are four messages when we're talking about racism, that racism exists, we need to say that. We need to say that racism is a system, that racism saps the strength of the whole society, and that we can act to dismantle racism. So this very short story I'm going to share with you right now is one of the allegories that I tell when I have four minutes or so to talk to a group of people to convey to people who may have lived their whole lives thinking this is the land of equal opportunity, that yes, racism exists. I call this story Dual Reality, a restaurant saga, and it's based on my own real life experience. One Saturday as a first year medical student, I had been studying long and hard in my apartment. Some friends had come over. We all got to studying long and hard and it got late and we got hungry and I had no food in the apartment, at which point my friends were like, oh yeah, we know that Kamara, but we're hungry. Let's go into town and find something to eat. So we do, we walk into town, we find a restaurant and we walk in and we sit down the menus are presented, we order our food, the food is served, here we are eating. So maybe not the story you thought I was gonna tell about a restaurant and racism, but hold on. As I sat in that restaurant eating with my friends, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign that was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now maybe I've intrigued you and you're like, okay, Dr. Jones, what did the sign say? Well, okay, what did the sign say? The sign said open. So now maybe I've lost some of you. So now let me recap. Here we are sitting in a restaurant eating. I look across the room. I see a sign that says open and thinking no more about it. I would have assumed that other hungry people could walk and sit down, order their food and eat. But because I knew something about the two-sided nature of that sign, I recognized that indeed the restaurant was now closed due to the hour, but firmly closed. And that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign would not be able to come in, sit down, order their food and eat. 
And that's when I recognize that racism structures open, closed signs in our society. That racism structures, if you will, a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating, and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it's difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it's difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It's difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. It's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context, although we are living that really big time right now with how we have sucked up so much of the, of the world's vaccine supply in this nation. But those on the outside are very well aware there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims close to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing to name racism. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do why, you could even talk to the restaurant owner who is after all inside with you. And you could say, restaurant owner, there are hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door and let them come in? You'll make more money and all the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you could do sitting inside that restaurant is pass some food through the window, or maybe you'll try to tear down the sign or break through the door, but at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't come on in and sit down and eat because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign. So I know I could go on and on about how we could build out this allegory, but just to say that racism is structuring a two-sided or multi-sided sign in our society, as is sexism, heterosexism, capitalism, all of these systems of structured inequity, that it's creating a dual or multifaceted reality. And when we are going to move and be about liberation and we're going to address justice and the like, we have to recognize that if we're born inside the restaurant, we need to listen to those on the outside who are saying black lives matter and gay lives matter. And all we need to pay attention and recognize our privilege in many ways. And I'll just say one more thing. Very often people only recognize the closed sign and don't recognize all their open signs. So there's so much more I can say about this. I am going to shut my mouth and sit down and go on to the next person. No, no, thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Thank you for the story. I think we're all, you know, to, just the way that you broke that down, you know, laying out the systems and the structures, the institutions, but also roles as individuals within those structures and how we operate. And we can certainly be on the outside, as you said, but we could be on the inside with that privilege. And I think we have to understand our role. So thank you so much Dr. for breaking Easterling? it down. Yes, Dr. Yes, yes. Easterling, let me go back through more questions. There's the part that I usually sure. close the story with, but I was so concerned okay. about time. So should I save that or should I say it now while people have the story in their mind? Just give me some advice. Uh, no, go, for it. go for it. You're going to keep it okay. under a minute? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I'm going to keep it under a minute. So, so <laughs> all I have to say is that that more people in this country are now recognizing that there's a two-sided sign going on. That's important. But if we just say a thing, if we just name racism, right, then mm. in six months, we may forget why we said that thing and fall back into what I describe as the sleepiness or somnolence of racism denial. So we have to go beyond acknowledging the two-sided nature of the sign, right? Um, and of course, you know, the people inside the restaurant you know, it's not just a sign, it's a sign, it's the doors are locked, there's a whole system going on. We need to go beyond naming a thing to acting, tearing down the sign, dismantling the lock, taking the door off the hinges. And when we do that, we will not forget why we are acting. So mm. just that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm so happy uh, that I did allow you to finish that story because that really sets us up nice for the next question. Uh, so I'm going to ask um, Lillian, uh, sort of thinking about, you know, the way in which Dr. Jones just framed it out for us uh, and, you know, what can we learn and apply from movements, you know, whether they're in the past or current, that are helping us sort of rip that door 
off of that institution or that establishment? Um, and if and like, what are you doing to bring this, up, you know, these these lessons that you're learning to your work with the National Birth Equity Collaborative? Thank you. Thank you for that question. And thank you, Dr. Jones. You are my public health hero. So I think of three particular liberation movements um, and individuals that stick out associated with those movements. And that's the National Organization for Women, or now Holly Murray, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, Ella Baker. And then for those following the East Conference basketball games right now are Milwaukee Books. Thinking of athletes um, and in relation to Milwaukee um, in the Midwestern region, um, Last summer, Jacob Blake was shot in the back seven times by a white police officer in Kenosha and how the Bucks um, took a stance in um, a long um, history of um, athletic resistance. So when I think of liberation movements, I think, and I wear my public health cap when I think of them, I think of urban conditions, the health of children, the mobilization in response to the, the condition of health and how this all equals the advancement of population health and real power in social movements and political action. And my contribution as an um, emerging leader in public health and what I will be doing in my role with the National Birth Equity Collaborative is what I've done in Wisconsin. And that's helped put Wisconsin on the map around declaring racism a public health crisis. So as um, someone who has been in a room and at tables being an only, and seeking a sense of community and wanting to create space and wanting to create collective power to be a disruptive innovator, right? You learn the rules, you learn the tradition of public health, you keep in mind the history of liberation movements and wanting to be free, right? You want to be like your ancestors, you want to honor your ancestors, and you want to leave your mark, right? I internalized, be the change you want to see. And with that, during my tenure as the at-large director for the Wisconsin Public Health Association, um, my visionary leadership, because we can't do it alone, helped to um, change how a membership-based organization develops the workforce, the emerging workforce around um, speaking race to power and thinking um, with innovation around talking about uh, concepts of privilege, power, and white and how that set the tone and set the stage for um, the city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County to do the same thing pre-pandemic and then during a pandemic to be the first jurisdiction in the nation to have a dashboard um, telling our story, disaggregating data by race and ethnicity, which informed our community response and action. And I hope to do the same with that impact. Just add to uh, the momentum. No, that, that, that's great. And thank you so much for all the work uh, that you have done uh, and really just sort of setting the stage for uh, so many other jurisdictions to come behind you. There are now, uh, you know, over 200 jurisdictions uh, that have uh, put forward in taking on an action, uh, as you have just described, sort of declaring racism as a public health crisis. We have certainly done so uh, in New York City, declaring it. But I think it, even more important, the committed actions, uh, the steps that you and Milwaukee have taken to make sure uh, to really embed this into your operations and your work, I think is really, really important. I do not want to miss that point. Um, all right. So I, I know that I have to really keep us to time. So I'm just going to move on uh, and I'm going to uh, bring up um, Marlon. Uh, next question, uh, Marlon, um, how does reckoning with past and current injustices, uh, you know, how does that really unfold as we're really dealing with inequities? Uh, and, you know, I think it's really important as, you know, I'm, I'm, digging, into, I'm digging into your book and I really appreciate uh, your memoir and, and, and how you're really setting the stage for, uh, you know, a, a state that, that we can talk about uh, abolitionists. And so if you can talk and put into words how language uh, really could be used to like really bring these ideas to life and we can vision this reckoning in a way that gets us to, uh, you know, liberation. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for the question. I'm also honored to be a part of this conversation here today. 
um, a couple of things. One that's done, a couple of things that come to mind is uh, so I chose to say like part of my background is also being a violence interrupter here in in New York City. That's kind of like where I earned my stripes, um, and a lot of my work is revolved around working with young folks in communities. Um, and most of my was experience a lot of the same as our young people experience today. I experienced as a kid, and that's where the memoir comes from. And the thing about reckoning is that, and if you, if you read the book that I wrote, like it's about being as honest as you can possibly be, and so honest that sometimes that that honesty may hurt you a little bit, right? And and so where we are in this nation, and we when we think about equity uh, or think about reckoning about issues of race in this country. I could, I could, I would want, I would question even at this point now in 2021, where we're like seeing the end of the pandemic potentially, right? Um, have we been as, what has been the result of the honesty, and have we been honest, honest enough? Um, and the reason why I say I think about, in a sense, like here, even in New York City, where um, I should always say, I see, I always see the violence that we experience in our communities as a result of a lot of underlying, underlying trauma. I don't only look at the thing that happened. I always want to find out like what's happening underneath that thing that's happening. Right. And, you know, one of the biggest debates that we have now in the city now is like, well, should we bring should, well, should we bring that stop question and frisk? And the mere fact that that is a question of debate now. Right. Even amongst people of color in the city. Right. And I have to ask, have we really done the reckoning around race? Right. We've done if you've done a reckoning around the race, around race. We understand how harmful that was to people of color. We, we, you know, we had the stories. We got all the YouTube videos or the documents, report. We have the Supreme Court even in, weighing in on this uh, calling on unconstitutional. But even still, this, this thing that we had with, with our like short memory, uh, we don't remember that. We see the instant issue right now, and then we go revert right back to what we thought would help. But we already have a bulk of evidence that shows that it harms. You know, you open up, I, I really appreciated the, the, the opening of the Black National Anthem. Because the first time I actually, re I just sort of like, I'm thinking of the words in the context, context of what we have now. And two stanzas that stand out for me is full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Right? And just sort of in that first stanza, like even in, in, even in recent history, when, we, when I was just speaking about um, the reckoning that we have even around, you know, public safety, it's almost as if, we're not learning the lessons that the dark past has taught us, right? And even still, like, you know, in the second stanza that stood out to me is like full of the hope that the present has brought us, right? So we had this place where we had we have we had so much engagement from young people, but we had a lot of engagement from so many groups and peoples of our of our society saying that we needed this racial reckoning, that we needed is that it that it had to happen for us all. And I think there's hope in that. Right, there's hope in that, but the problem is that we quickly forget the 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 the, the, the dark the darkness that our past has taught us. Right, um, and I'll close off with this. Um, you know, the first lady McRae spoke about the um, the her experience at PS seventy eight, I believe it was in Staten Island, and the question that these young people were asking um, about feelings, why these things were happening, and, and instead of just reacting as we tend to do as humans, they were asking questions. Right. And I think that's a model. I think that's where the hope lies. I think there's hope in that, that these young people are asking these questions that those of us on this panel probably don't ask enough, right? I'm not, you know, I'm saying, or just, I'm just saying, adult, I'm just saying adults enough. Adults don't ask enough, right? There's hope in that. But the thing about that hope is that the reckoning has to be so truthful that it can't, that it may hurt a little bit. I think that when, when we get to the point where it starts hurting a little bit, we tend to back away. That hurting can look like upticks in violence in our communities. It can look like that, right? And we, we can't be afraid of the hurt before at the end of it. The mere fact that these young people are saying these things, right? Asking questions that adults don't ask. There is hope in it. And I want us to be able to cling on that. But that's some of what I see as the, the great consequences, the great sort of um, results of what can happen when we have true racial reckoning. Thanks. Thanks so much, Marlon. Yeah, no, I, I think those are all good points uh, and certainly appreciate the way that you're framing, you know, how we have to deal with this reckoning, right? And the pain that we can experience upon ourselves, but also the pain uh, that uh, we can cause loved ones or, you know, folks in our circle. And I know that, you know, you really, you know, deal with this in, in your book. 
And I think that that is, you know, certainly something that, you know, as we were talking about from the very beginning, like we have to be bold and courageous enough, courageous enough to have these conversations. Um, all right. So, so I'm going to ask Ted, um, Ted, can you share your thoughts about how we could break cycles of oppression on a systemic level? Um, how do you bring this into your writing, into the, in, in, in the arts that you create? Uh, thank you for that. And it is such a pleasure to be on such a powerful panel. I feel most human when I am with other people thinking about tough things together. And to Marlon's point, then when those moments of pain come in, I know that we can share them or at least it can be witnessed. So thank you for that. And that is part of my experience in this collective I'm a part of called What Would an HIV Doula Do? And we are inspired by doulas for birth, abortion, end of life, and gender. And with that in mind, we understand that a doula is someone who holds space during times of transition. All those things that I just mentioned are transitions. And we think of HIV as a series of transitions that start long before someone gets a test, throughout the treatment experience, and beyond. And we also understand that we can doula each other, we can doula ourselves, we can doula the community, and we can doula the systems we live under. And I'm going to come back to that point in a second. But also to kind of bring it back to some of the themes that we've heard today, foundational to our work is asking questions. So I'm really excited to be here. Um, one of the projects that we just finished doing that I think directly answers your question is um, we curated an exhibition called Metanoia, Transformation Through AIDS, Archives, and Activism. And it featured historic and contemporary stories, including the life-saving activism of two powerful people, um, Katrina Haslip and Joanne Walker. Both are Black women who were living with HIV, and while they were incarcerated, they worked with AIDS activists on the outside who fought for rights and freedoms for themselves. They understood that their lives mattered and they were fighting for themselves. And then they were also fighting for everybody else too. So for example, Joanne Walker fought for the early release of prisoners living with HIV and for at least decent medical care for people living with, living with HIV in prison. And Katrina Haslip, um, worked with people to help ensure that the U.S.'s definition of AIDS included women. And I don't know if you know this, but before 1993, the definition of AIDS did not include women. So women and other people could not get services, could not get the care that they needed for themselves, their families, and their community. And we think it's important to tell these stories through exhibition, through publication, through conversations for three reasons. One, it's not only important that we say the name of our dead, we also need to name the tools and tactics that they use to thrive, survive, and die with dignity. We also think that stories push back against silence and apathy because even more than 40 years into the AIDS crisis, we know that silence still equals death. Shout out to the art behind uh, the First Lady right now. And also we know that stories um, can promote discussion around one of the most vital questions to emerge out of the AIDS response, and that is, who is the public in public health? Right now, I think there is an assumption that the public is a group of illness-free people that need a government agency to save them from irresponsible and sick individuals. We saw this play out with COVID and we still see that with HIV. I'm thinking specifically of this horrible campaign called HIV Stops With Me, in which people living with HIV are invited to name their resiliency in the face of a life-threatening illness, but are then also burdened with ending the crisis themselves. In fact, we know HIV stops with the state and it stops with the eradication with, of economic inequality, the war on drugs, racism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia, and more. Stories can doula the system. Over the last 15 months, this is the last thing I'll say, What Would an HIV Doula Do published a bunch of zines, including What Can an Uprising Doula Do? And Harm Reduction is Not a Metaphor. In that last zine, we, public, we highlighted Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Michael Callan, Richard Berkowitz, and the Junkie Union. All of these people are harm reduction pioneers who remind us that the public and public health is us. And together we share culture, we share wisdom, we share illness, we share viruses, we share treatment, we share resources, and we share cures. doula be it through art, culture, policy, or medicine, reminds us that no individual or no agency has all the answers. Liberation is a collective practice. Thank you so much, Thank Seth. You so Thank, much. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Great. And, and it, you know, this is really just bringing together a lot of the themes that have come up in our previous panels, 
around building trustworthiness, around collective recovery, and around using narratives around storytelling for justice and healing. And certainly, I think, you know, just, you know, things that I've heard, you know, is really just defining, you know, who is within the universe that we're talking about, like, how are we creating communities, healthy communities, and who really gets to define those structures, define those interventions, I think is really important that we need, we need to make sure that we're very encompassing of all of those actors and stakeholders and partners to really create. And, uh, and, I, and I'm saying create because, you know, I just remember one of our, our previous panelists, uh, Gabriel Torres, really talking about we're all creators in this space, and we really have to make sure that we're using our skills and our talents to, to create uh, uh, spaces of healing uh, for all. So I, I thank you so much for, for, for lifting up uh, those points. Um, all right, so I'm gonna ask uh, Morningstar to, to help us close out this segment. Um, and I think that this really sort of connects to a, a lot of the themes that we've already heard uh, in the work that we're trying to do. But uh, Morningstar, if you can sort of talk about uh, the moment that we're in and really define it. Um, do, you, do, do you think that this is a turning point for justice? Uh, do we see this moment uh, as a different, as different from any pe other period uh, that uh, we've seen past movements go through? Uh, or you know our our forefathers and foremothers go through what 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 are we seeing now? Jimmy Sunwe, thank you so much for having me on. I just want to acknowledge that I'm on the homelands of the Nisanan, Miwok, and Maidu peoples. It's an honor to be included with all of you today. Um, I want to share that this is absolutely a turning point for justice. That we are at a time of truth telling. We are at a time of healing. We are at a time of reckoning of truth and reconciliation. And although there's a lot of work that needs to be done, that even having these conversations, even having the land acknowledgements where there has been so much erasure and invisibility of native peoples that we are at a time now. I would like to ask to take it a step further and acknowledge that there needs to be also, um, uh, you know, including an, the inclusion of the Native peoples. And so acknowledging the land, but acknowledging us as living beings who still exist on the land, who are still very much here and present, and not just speaking of us in the past tense. Um, because the Lenape people still live very much um, within the New York territories and are alive and are thriving. Um, and so acknowledging that we are at a time where, where I'm even able to say that and that those comments are, are welcomed and included. And so, you know, making sure that we're at a time um, in my 17 years of being a parent, it was just in this past year that within the public school system that my children are now learning um, lessons and, and having um, those educational um, teachings within, within their studies of Native peoples um, living within the present tense and who they are today. And so I think that we are absolutely at a time um, here in, in California, some of the work that I do is around the environmental health issues and the toxic legacy of gold grade and genocide. And so for 172 years, we've been dealing with um, what occurred with the California gold rush and the massacres that occurred to where gold was mined and the resource extraction that occurred to where we 250 tons of mercury um, that are within our rivers and within our our lakes and within the Bay Area. And so those environmental health effects that we're able to deal with at this time, um, you know, we're able to call on the EPA and call on the BIA that are responsible for um, the cleanup of that and to call for the environmental health um, and, and equity within our tribal communities. Thank you so much, Morningstar. Yeah, uh, really important, and, and you're absolutely right. I think we do have to, you know, really expand the way in which we're framing, you know, our, our acknowledgement of the people, uh, and really, you know, centering uh, the the contributions of Native Americans to, to all of our work. And so, really appreciate that. And I and I do think that we're we, there is a shift, and I think we have to grab hold uh, of that shift so that we can make sure. Uh, that we're moving forward um, and getting uh, to uh, this, the state and the communities that we want. Um, all right, so, so with that, we're going to shift to our next segment. 
Uh, and uh, for our next segment, uh, we're going to, you know, we really just started to scratch the surface here. Um, we're going to begin to share more approaches and a vision for liberation and reckoning. Uh, and uh, with that, I am going to welcome uh, my colleague and comrade, Dr. Michelle Morris, uh, to the virtual stage, and I will step back. Thank you so much, Dr. Easterling. And again, just really honored to be um, supporting uh, and in dialogue with such a distinguished panel. Um, thank you also, Dr. Easterling, for your work fighting around reckoning and liberation for many years here in the New York City Health Department. Um, and really honored to delve into um, how we can look forward. Um, reckoning doesn't always lead to liberation. Um, and I'm really, really interested in going a little bit deeper with all of you in this round of, of questions and dialogue um, about what the path forward could look like. Um, we know that uh, not all of it is up to us, but what it could look like. Um, so I want to start with Dr. Jones, actually, and ask uh, a follow-up question based on um, the powerful, infamous, compelling, <laughs> two-sided sign um, allegory that you uh, jumped off with at the beginning of this conversation. Um, and I just want to ask you um, to explore for us what happens if we don't recognize the central nature of global solidarity in this pandemic and how the two-sided sign um, applies to our global interconnectedness, right? We're at this tipping point moment where um, vaccine apartheid uh, globally is more evident than ever. And yet there is a serious reckoning coming um, if we can't figure out how to act differently, recognizing our interdependence. So I was hoping you could help us think a little bit about what the path forward looks like moving out of vaccine apartheid and into global solidarity and global liberation. Well, thank you. And that's a huge question, <laughs> Dr. Morse. But uh, so honestly, right now within the United States, uh, even though Within the United States, where you know there's racism and there's all this stuff, we right now are hogging up so much of the global vaccine supply, and don't even recognize that we feel entitled. Uh, it's because of our narrow focus on the individual that makes systems and structures invisible. Our you know Amer this myth of American exceptionalism. What we need to do is to recognize that in this instance, the U.S. being inside the restaurant and feeling safe and, and just uh, mildly interested in those on the outside have to recognize that, that our vaccines are not going to save us. Our wealth is not going to save us because as long as the pandemic is raging anywhere, this is a pandemic. We are all in this together. We cannot cut ourselves off from other people. And even at the very most selfish level every time the virus replicates then it can mutate we're already mildly worried about the delta variant that arose in india is becoming predominant in the uk and now and rising and rising in the us but then the next sentence that you hear newscasters say is but the vaccines that we have are good against the delta virus." that is not the question as people are dying you know, we need to care about all of us, right? We are losing the brilliance and the strength and power of so many around the world. And then if we feel complacent, then the Epsilon variant, maybe either the Gamma variant or whatever is going to come in and burst through our vaccines. So even if we were just being selfish, then we need to recognize that a global pandemic requires global action. So beautifully um, and powerfully stated. And um, I went a little off script, so <laughs> um, thank you for coming up, coming up with such a, um, a clear and compelling um, vision for how we move forward. And thank you again um, for, for those comments. Um, I wanna move to um, Lillian Payne with the next question about where we go from here and what liberation could offer, what a, what a vision for liberation could offer. Um, and Lillianne, you know, again, just a huge appreciation to you for um, your foundational work 
um, really putting forward a declaration of racism as a public health crisis for the first time in 2018 um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, and as was already mentioned by Dr. Easterling, the ripple effects of that um, bold and courageous action across our world, not even just our nation. I'm connected with colleagues in Spain who who are able to pass a declaration based on yours, um, really, again, declaring racism a public health crisis. So you have launched a global movement for declaring racism a public health crisis. And I'm curious if you could describe for us um, what it would look like if declarations really happened at scale globally, um, not, not uh, beyond the 200 uh, uh, jurisdictions that have already made these declarations, what would happen? What would you imagine? What could you see um, for this world um, if we were able to really make the declarations, not uh, uh, declarations, but actually foundational policy across this country and across the world? Um, how would that get us closer to a vision for liberation? That is a wonderful way to to um, hope and dream, right? To practice Octavia Butler's um, belief of predicting the future. And um, when I think of what that would look like, I, I wanna start out by saying there's, there's a true sense of community. Like Ella Baker said, who are your people? You know who your people are. We think of people and community as what we're born into or you know our chosen family. So in the sense that, um, you know, people can truly embody what a global family is. And I also think of respecting the law of consequences as Octavia Butler taught us. So just because we come to a place where, you know, um, we've achieved equality through equity, that doesn't mean there aren't consequences from race neutral policies that have existed or that we are um, rebuilding and reimagining upon a foundation that's centered in white supremacy. And then to be aware of a perspective, right? Um, we are living in a, and experiencing daily um, folks talking about critical race theory and not truly understanding it or trying to make decisions for a community without listening to the community just with the pandemic response. And we have to be aware of our perspectives. We have to, um, I think, not just throw terms around, um, something to reference if, if the audience isn't familiar with Sister Song's definition of reproductive justice. I, I think when we think of and be aware of certain perspectives, we have to honor that people have choice, people have autonomy. And that again, even if we have equality, it's honoring and respecting people's choices and not making decisions on their part without them informing that process. And then um, counting on surprises. <laughs> like there can be beautiful surprises. And tonight was a beautiful surprise. I feel like I have a larger um, network and a sense of family when it comes to public health at New York City. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, for that very um, just inspiring, um, beautiful response. Really, um, again, just appreciate your work, appreciate the, the vision and direction you see us going in. And um, of course, working together, excited about that. Um, yes, I, I want to put the next, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to put the next question to Ted. Um, and Ted, it was really powerful to hear you speak about um, what we, could and should have learned from the HIV pandemic. Um, I, I will say for myself, um, most of any political education that, that I started with as a medical student came from being engaged in the HIV AIDS movement um, and the movement for justice um, around access to care. Um, and we've lost a lot of people unnecessarily. Um, uh, due to um, a lack of equity when it comes to HIV, especially in the early, early days. Um, and I wanna ask you a question that also brings us forward. Um, thinking about the folks that we know um, that we may have lost, um, what would they advise us to be thinking about in this moment, in this particular moment in the history of this world, in this moment, again, of reckoning um, at a moment where, is the, where there is a potential for liberation, 
if they could speak now, how might they, uh, and I'm asking you to take a huge leap here, but what do you think they might tell us? How might they advise us to keep pushing forward into a vision for liberation, despite all of the setbacks we've talking, been talking about? Um, amen to that question. I really believe in the power of ghosts in telling us how to move forward. And even more than the power of ghosts, I believe in the, the people that are on the streets yelling and screaming for liberation right now. And that includes the most amazing AIDS activist group in New York called Vocal New York. And two of my favorite members of New York past and present are Jason Walker and Jawanza Williams. And they taught me this phrase and I'm going to share it with y'all and I hope it's helpful. It is we could end the crisis tomorrow without a cure. And I'm just going to use that silence and I'm going to repeat it so we can think about it. We could end the crisis tomorrow without a cure. And in many ways, the city of New York does so many good things that the activists have fought for and then fought to maintain, like housing, like access to medication, like mental health care. And it shouldn't be so hard to try to keep that. So I would say what the ghosts are telling me and what the activists are telling me and what my belly is telling me is that we have to make it so people do not have to fight for what is right. And this is where I'll end. I think we have to, I'm very leery about comparing COVID and HIV. And yet I'm compelled to tell us that when it comes to COVID and HIV, we are in the 1996 moment. In 1996, life-saving medication was introduced and all of a sudden lots of people could live their lives and HIV was no longer a death sentence. It became a prison sentence for some, but it was no longer a death sentence for many people. And that was amazing. They were able to move on. But so many people, that is not true because of systemic bias, because of racism, because of transphobia, because of misogyny. And we're seeing that with COVID too. I'm seeing so many of my friends who are getting vaccinated and for them COVID is done. And I would say, how do we keep people in the liberatory moment without suffering? How do we keep people with that alertness that they had last March and April to consider themselves as part of an interconnected world? How do we keep that right now? And I have some ideas, but I'm sure other people on the panel do as well. I want to say that when COVID first was recognized and people, um, some of the HIV activists who were also, you know, like in my circle were like, oh no, we cannot let what happened with HIV happen with COVID. They were predicting that when a cure, when something good came, then it would settle into the disinvested parts of our communities, the devalued, the dehumanized parts of our society. So your warning is exactly uh, what we are seeing. And so I just, I have three uh, principles for achieving health equity that I just want to throw out and hear other people respond to before we get to, to Morningstar. Um, and those three principles are valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices and providing resources according to need. And we could go deep into how do you know if you're valuing all individuals and populations equally well? Think about how you might value your children your, or your nieces and nephews. You would protect them. You would invest in them. You would celebrate them. You would invite their voices. Are we doing that for all individuals and communities equally? Are we, uh, how do you recognize and rectify historical injustices? First, learn our full histories, right? as Morningstar was talking about, right? And as so many of us recognize and this whole push of the, uh, you know, against uh, critical race theory, when really they're saying, we don't want to talk about our history as a nation. We don't want to talk about racism, white supremacy. We don't want to talk about any of those things, uh, but then being willing to rectify. So reparations, that's not a bad word. That's a necessary step. And then finally, the, the last one, which is providing resources according to need, we have to, establish metrics of need, but then have the political spine when we have limited resources to provide resources according to need, not equally. So I just want to stop there because we've been encouraged to pick up on each other's thoughts. And uh, so I just think that, that, yeah, COVID is about to become HIV in the worst ways. Again, unless we value all individuals and populations equally, recognize and rectify historical injustices and provide resources according to need. So beautifully stated. And, and if any panelists want to jump in and react on that, please, um, please jump right in. I'll come back to my question for Morningstar. 
And if not, I'll in jump agreement. right in. Great. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Everyone's in agreement. And mm-hmm. memorizing the three pieces. So I, <laughs> um, we appreciate that. Kamara, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to Morningstar and and ask you um, just one more question and then it's uh, it's free for all for the panelists and free for all for all of you in the audience. Thank you for sending in your questions. We are looking at them right now. We're gonna start posing them to this incredible panel. Um, we really appreciate everyone that's tuned in uh, for this conversation. Uh, and 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 with that, let me just pose this question to Morningstar and then uh, and then open it up um, yet again. Um, so, morning, sorry, I heard you speak um, so powerfully and clearly um, again about um, Indigenous people, your um, work, your work around narrative, your work around um, reckoning and liberation. Um, and I wanted to ask you if you would be willing to share a little bit more with us about how our history gets us to liberation. And I'm thinking of um, the book title, uh, Nick Estes, Our History is the Future. Um, and it, it resonates really powerfully, I think, with the work that you were describing, um, the approach that you take uh, to the work of social justice and equity. Um, so are there things that you think we need to be um, reminding ourselves of about how our history gets us to liberation, how our history reminds us of what liberation should look like? Absolutely. I think a lot of it was just mentioned in, in the past segment in terms of our collective values as Indigenous peoples, in terms of thinking of ourselves outside of the individual, of thinking of how Indigenous methodologies are evidence-based. And we know that because we're here and we've survived pandemics, we've survived biological warfare, we've survived, you know, onslaught. And, and so, you know, thinking of it in that way that you know we need to ensure that our traditional values that our practices um that are very much you know all of these lessons from from the pandemic from this past year of you know not taking more than you need of looking out for one another of ensuring that our most vulnerable populations are are looked after that is how we will survive that is how we will get through these most difficult times and it's not anything that's new it's not anything that you know is um you know has been forgotten but it's very much continuing on this ancestral memory and this ancestral lineage um of truth telling of you know living and walking within our truth and within our power and within um remembering you know our our solidarity with one another and that is how we were able to survive at times is that through our our communities and through being able to help and support one another is is the way that we were able to get through so many difficulties historically and present may i jump in with a with an amen on sure. that and and to say <laughs> that 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 the values that you're talking about are not the predominant kind of eurocentric what i would call white values that that are guiding so much of of how things happen in the united states today so i just want to list and would love people to 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 bounce off of these i have identified seven values targets for anti-racism action or the seven social delusions that undergird the intergenerational transmission of racism denial or just seven barriers to achieving health equity the first is our narrow focus on the individual which is completely not an indigenous value but it's the white value that is the na national value this narrow focus on the individual that makes systems and structures invisible or seemingly irrelevant and even separates us from our power. Because if we're thinking, what can I do about racism or COVID or anything, then we are missing the point. It's like, what can we do? Understanding the power of collective. The second is the fact that we're ahistorical and we act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. The third is our endorsement of the myth of meritocracy, that if you work hard, you'll make it. Understanding, yes, most people who have made it have worked hard, but there are many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field, which is structured and perpetuated by racism, sexism, heterosexism, capitalism, and the like. The fourth is our myth of a zero sum game. If you gain, I lose, which sets us up in competition with one another. It masks the cost of inequity that racism and all these other systems are sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources, and it hinders efforts for us to grow the pie. 
The fifth is our limited future orientation. The parts of the future that we can touch today, each of us, that will hopefully survive us are the children and the planet. But in this country, we have, in, in, the, white, in the white framework of this country, we have a disregard for the children and a usurious relationship with the planet. The sixth is this myth of American exceptionalism. We even call it American exceptionalism, you know, not US exceptionalism. We've taken Canada, US, Mexico, all of Central and South America and, and claiming American to be us, but that we are so special, so unique, so ordained by God, which makes us feel entitled to have so much of the vaccine supply right now in this nation. And it makes us unwilling to learn from other nations. The seventh is white supremacist ideology, which is actually the first, let's be honest. <laughs> that is the foundational one. But this myth that there's a hierarchy of human valuation by race with, so there is no such hierarchy, but the myth that there is and that the further myth that if there were, that would put white people at the top as the ideal or the norm, which gives many people who are living as white a sense of entitlement. It results in the devaluation and dehumanization of people of color and fear at the browning of America that's underlying a lot of our political divide today. So I just appreciate what you described as, yes, of course, we have these values that have protected us for centuries, for millennia. And in this country, we are disregarding the wisdom of our indigenous people. We are disregarding everything that we could learn and we're just marching off this cliff. But, but the ones who are, who are leading the march off the cliff feel like they're going to be escaped up into Mars or, you know, they're going to jump on a on a spaceship, you know, in a minute. So people do not understand that we really are all in this together. Okay, I've been speaking too long again. Responses, anybody want to jump I would just that? add, I would add for those that want to dig a little deeper and need some terminology, we, what, what, what you just shared, um, Dr. Kamara, was um, types of power. And you talked about racial fallacies and the frames of colorblind racism. So if you need to dig a little deeper, um, do a Google search on those terms and learn some more. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I think there is so much to unpack there. <laughs> um, and in fact, that's kind of what I, why I wanna bring in a question from the audience. This question, I think goes exactly to the heart of what we've been talking about and also um, takes us from the analysis of the challenge and into like, where do we start? And I know I've heard um, all of you in various forums speak about how, we, how do we chip away? What's the first step? Um, how do we actually get into this work um, so this question comes from Jocelyn Warren, um, and the question is, health justice is so big. Where do we start? How do we start? Um, and I think it's just such a, a fundamental question in this work, especially when we're talking about huge things like reckoning and liberation. Um, so I'm curious, you know, not whoever feels so inspired to jump in um, and, and share thoughts about, you know, how do we start? Where do we, what's the first step um, for those of us who are looking to take a first step? Um, how do we start in this work when health justice feels so big um, and so hard to chip away at? I have an idea, so I'll start. <laughs> oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ted. Go on. Okay, I would say that you've already begun, right? By asking the question, you've already begun, and that hopefully takes away some of the pressure. And I would say number two, um, remember that you're not alone. And I think as has been said many times on this panel, like you do not have to begin. You, you, it, it, there is an invitation somewhere in this world for you to join in. And I would say the next is love. Like we begin with love. So I got involved in HIV because the people who were slightly older than me that I thought were cool or I thought were sexy we're doing HIV work. And so if I was ever gonna get a boyfriend, if I was ever gonna have the adult life I wanted to, if I wanted to love myself and love my community, I was gonna get involved in HIV. And then that through that, I learned that HIV is an intersectional issue. And so I learned how to love myself more and I learned how to love everybody else more. And that has been my road to health justice work. I also want to pick up on Lillianne's work and in sparking these now at least 207 declarations that racism is a public health crisis across 36 states and counting, um, that those declarations are a, a stake in the sand, right, of 
of cities, so city councils, county commissions, 10 at the state level. This is important work. But as I said, naming a problem is essential if you're going to address the problem, but it is necessary and insufficient. We must move to action. So an examination of those 207 and counting racism declarations uh, gives us you know, a sense of where other people have started. So some people are investing in the work that is already going on in communities where people are trying to solve their own problems. Some people are trying to bring new voices to their decision-making tables. Uh, some people are creating policy checklists or whatever that we must uh, address these issues before any policy goes forward. So I think that that's a good start. But for me, the, the first step is either if you find yourself at a decision-making table or you're setting one to look around and say who is not here who has an interest in this proceeding and then your job is not just to represent their interests your job is to create space to find them a way to the table so that because who's at the table then determines what is on the agenda it under it undergirds the values that are going to be expressed. So of all of the who, what, when, where, how, and why of decision-making, the most important thing to me is who's at the table. And for those of us who are outside of my little, you know, dual reality, you know, outside the restaurant, we need to know our power. We need to recognize that action is power and that collective action is power. So we actually don't need to sit around and wait to be invited at decision-making tables. We need to create our own <laughs> decision-making tables. So, you know, there's a lot in that. And I want to hear other people. I'm so sorry. Don't apologize. Don't apologize. Oh, please go ahead, Lillian. Absolutely. I would just add to, to that um, is, I'm sorry, getting a phone call. Um, again, another resource, the Management Center. If you all haven't heard about it or have experienced it, I highly recommend it. And they've identified some choice points in collaboration with Race Forward. So three things to add on to what this illustrious panel has already presented is to ask yourself when you're at a decision-making table or if you're creating one, who is this process or policy serving? Who is this building power for? And who benefits the most from whatever those outcomes will be that that's, this table is going to create? so clear and so and simple right and like that's the thing right if it if you're in a in a place where you're taking a first step that is thank you for that direction thank you um to all of you for that um i do want to put forward another really awesome question from the audience if you guys don't mind i know that there's a lot more to say so feel free um to interrupt me and stop me but um i think this is a great question that really gets at what uh, was just described as well um, and also gets us grounded in what it means to push forward in a liberatory framework and it's a question um, around silos um, and this question is from lewis wesser uh, what are the ways we can break down organizational silos in public health, especially in low resource environments? Um, and again, it's one of the most important steps, I would say, um, in building an intersectional framework and building an intersectional um, uh, you know, team for change, um, for sure. Um, so curious if, if you all have any thoughts about um, how we get out of our silos um, and love, of course, um, that we're not all public health on this panel. So that helps us as well um, to put the mirror up and think about uh, uh, how we do that. May I, may I throw something out to start, start thinking? I don't even think the issue is breaking down silos. I think it's building bridges between silos because there's there's power in some kind of concentrated thing. But what we the silos uh, are so tight that we don't build bridges. I mean, I actually think that if a public health agency sent somebody over to the Department of Education for six months and the Department of Education swapped and, and sent somebody over to public health and then I'd be say, sitting at the education table and I'm, I'll be saying, oh, but we talk about those same things, but here's how we talk about it. Here are the resources we have to bear. And the other person, the education and public health is saying the same thing. Then we start building common cause. We, we, we break through the silos and the other silos that we have are institutional walls. And so I think Another power building thing is to make our institutional walls as porous as we can, to recognize the power of an inside-outside strategy. Those people who are inside 
institutions and are trying to bring about positive change sometimes will be get pushback and all they need the people on the outside saying no you cannot fire that person or you can't treat them that way the people on the outside need to the people on the inside to say well here are the resources that are coming down the pike here are the grants or here's here's the the meeting that's about to happen we need you to come or we need your agenda items so to the extent that we can make our our institutional walls more porous for a, a community institutional inside outside thing because all of us at some point are going to be either inside or outside and we should be comfortable switching roles all the time right but also to build bridges between sectors um and not try to own the table it's not even like health should invite you know immigration and justice and and all to the health table we need to be going to other people's tables we shouldn't be trying to own tables we should be building bridges can i jump in this is like the biggest game of double dutch ever. It's very intimidating and fun. Um, what I would say is uh, me and my co-writer, Dr. Alexander Yuaz, we say that silence is not the absence of sound. It's the pain of not being heard by others. That's actually silence is not being heard by others. And when we talk about silos, that's what's happening. You're just being heard. You're not being heard by others. And so I would echo everything that Dr. Jones just said. We have to make noise. And sometimes that noise is activism, right? It's loud and it's raucous and it's public. But then something uh, uh, Dr. Payne keeps on uh, talking about Ella Baker, and that's also Ella Baker teaches such important ways to make sound, right? Through conversation, through intimacy, through building community. So I just say, I just want to let everything everybody said and say, Dr. Ella Baker again. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, there are many, yeah, many I, more ask, I want, I want to hear Morning Star. Yeah. I want to hear Morning Star. I want to hear whatever's on your mind as you're listening to this, because you're sitting there and there's so much wisdom in there, and 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 so whatever's on your mind, I want to hear. You. I'm just soaking it in, honestly. Thank you so much um, for this conversation. I just feel like it's so rich and I'm not directly in, in the public health field myself, but working in environmental health and working um, to address equity and, and the issues within our communities, both tribal um, and intertribal. And so I'm thinking about, you know, our communities here within, within our reservation lands that do not have um, you know, uh, drinking water that do not have, you know, the, the basic, you know, how, how is it that we're sending our children to school when we're not able to, to meet basic needs of, um, you know, having, you know, food shortages. And, and so just thinking of all of that and, and in the ways that, um, you know, we're able to bring, bring that conversation in, um, that I think that there's a lot of misconceptions that, you know, because there are tribes within California um, that have been able to, you know, just a handful that have been able to um, be successful through, you know, through financial en endeavors, that there's an assumption that all of tribes are, are thriving when very much they are dealing with these health inequities and, you know, the, the high cancer rates and all of that that comes with these environmental health crises. Thank you. I'm sorry to have put you on the spot, but I just, I just wanted to know <laughs> what you were thinking. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that that's a, a perfect um, segue to just asking each of you for a final thought, a final, you know, 20 second or less thought. And I'm going to ask you an, a question that's impossible to answer in 20 seconds. And I'm going to I'm going to put it forward anyway, just to close us out. Um, I really, again, just appreciate all the wisdom, all of the um, inspiring um, thoughts and reflections and um, the framing that you all have shared um, around what some of the paths forward in this work out of this moment um, into a liberatory framework could look like. So um, final question um, for each panelist, and I'm going to kind of go in the same order that I asked that uh, a round of questions in. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ask you to share your thoughts on this question of um, what's one thing that you think we need to reimagine for public health that centers racial justice, equity, and community power um, in this particular moment. One thing we really need to reimagine. Um, and again, I know you could write a book about it, and, and some of you have, um, but, but uh, if you could share kind of one thing that comes to mind 
um, would appreciate it. And Dr. Jones, I'll take it, take it to you first. Well, the one thing is to recognize that all children are our children. So there's no such thing as my children versus your children. So I think that we need to invest. Well, I have a four part policy agenda. Uh, and the fourth one is to invest in children and their families so that the phrase disadvantaged child will have no meaning, that there's no possibility of a child either being born into or finding themselves in disadvantage. I just want to say in the rest of my minute, the other three parts of my uh, kind of uh, policy agenda are reparations to descendants of Africans enslaved in the US and full honoring of treaties with our indigenous uh, sisters and brothers, that's one. Decarceration or abolition is two. And then the third one uh, is massive investments in communities of color. So this is specifically to communities of color. Marshall Plan types of investments around housing and environmental cleanup and education and green space and businesses and, and wealth building and all. And then the fourth is massive investments around all children and their families. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Lillianne, um, for you, the the one thing, and you can say a few, <laughs> the one thing you would reimagine. I love those big P aspirations um, that Dr. Kamara Jones has just shared. Like I said, she's my public health hero. Um, what I would add is that a lot of people are leaving public health right now that have been in it. Like it was a career choice for them. Um, they dedicated their life to that service. And then you have individuals like myself that have been in it for a little bit. And then we get in a leadership role and we're like, uh, we got to clean this up first before we can really um, reimagine and make uh, sustainable contributions. So my one thing would be is that we all think of what our time is like before we become an ancestor and the stories and imprints we want to leave as we are on our journey passing through. <laughs> um, a lot of harm is done when folks hold on to things too long. And a lot of harm is done when we don't uh, approach these spaces with enthusiastic curiosity. So that's what I would say. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Ted. <laughs> um, it's getting deep. Um, I would say uh, I, I, my first remarks were that question that I take from the AIDS response is who is the public and public health? And I would invite everybody who's watching who thinks they're a care provider to remember that they are a care receiver and really then think about that question, who is the public and public health? I would ask myself and I would ask everyone else to reimagine what it means by expert. Um, I am, I love Shiro, but I'm not sure how I feel about the word hero. I don't like heroes. I don't like the top of pyramids, right? Like, I just think we have to change expert culture. And then I was really inspired by something Morningstar said. And I think this, one of the takeaways that I'll have from today, and I hope will improve my work is to like, check my assumptions. What am I assuming about people, communities, myself and the world? And can I have conversations about those assumptions that will lead to a better world for everybody? Thank you. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone that this is a, obviously an incredible conversation and dialogue and you all are just dropping pearls left and right. Um, but we are planning to actually um, look back at this conversation and each part of the series so far um, and do our best to distill um, some of the big pearls um, out of it and, and use it um, again as a framing going forward. Um, so I, I, I just had to say that because you're, you're, you're just giving us so much um, here in the New York City Health Department um, to integrate into our work and to um, set as a North Star um, for our work mm -hmm. as we look towards a just recovery in COVID. Um, and Morningstar, please, um, the thing you would reimagine. 
what I would reimagine is currently in motion. And so I have to shout out our MH First program. I serve in a volunteer role um, for our Healing Justice uh, Committee for the Anti-Police Terror Project Sacramento. And so both in Sacramento and Oakland now, we have instituted community alternatives to policing through mental health services. Um, so the MH First program um, is is a dream of one of our co-founders, Asantua Boykin. And I, so I just want to acknowledge that and that it's happening. These volunteer um, clinics and hotlines are taking place on the weekends. And so that we have alternatives in place now where we know that our community can turn to and, and be safe. What a beautiful last comment. <laughs> Thank you, Morningstar, for reminding us that liberation is happening right now, right? And that reimagining is happening right now. Um, I can't think of a better um, final comment. And um, I want to just thank all of our panelists. Um, I want to um, bring Dr. Easterling back on the stage for us to close us out. Um, I want to thank Dr. Jones for reminding us about the two-sided sign, um, as well as the three points principles, the seven values, and the four policy priorities. Um, I want to thank Lillianne um, again for your work around the declarations, um, for your words of wisdom about how we look forward. Um, I want to thank Ted for reminding us about lessons learned from the HIV AIDS movement and how they apply um, today. Even though HIV and COVID are different, they, there are frameworks and guideposts for us. Um, I want to thank Marlon, who's no longer on the screen, but who reminded us uh, that reckoning and liberation can be painful and that we have to keep building up our emotional, psychological, and community muscles to get us through um, these phases. And to Morningstar, um, again, I mean, the, I can't summarize your words, but reminding us um, that history is present, history is future, um, and that uh, reckoning reimagining and liberation are happening right now and we're all a part of it. So um, thank you um, to all of you as panelists. Um, we're going to close uh, this session. This is the fourth part um, of this series, Reimagining Public Health for New York City. Um, we're so thankful for all of you who tuned in for this conversation, especially to all of you who put questions forward. Even if we didn't get to your question, um, we appreciate you. We appreciate you for listening um, and watching um, and joining. As I mentioned, we do plan to do more with this, uh, this particular conversation, as well as the three prior um, panels uh, as a part of this series. Um, we look uh, to the incredible minds and hearts and spirits of all of the panelists to help us forge a path forward, a roadmap forward for a just recovery from COVID um, and for, again, the healing um, and for the, um, um, the forward thinking, the, the vision forward uh, for how we emerge from this pandemic. Um, and so I, again, hope that all of you will complete the post-event survey. Um, I think it might be possible to bring Dr. Easterling back on the stage as well so that we can close out um, and we just want to, uh, again, appreciate everyone, um, ask you to complete the post-event survey, um, remind you that the whole entire series is available on the New York City Health Department's YouTube and Facebook page, um, and that we also want you to stay tuned for more in the series after the summer uh, as well. Um, Dr. Easterling, I don't know if you want to make any final, final comments before we close out. Uh, I've just been blown away uh, by uh, our panelists uh, today. This, as you've already heard um, from Dr. Morris, uh, this is our fourth, uh, you know, panel for for this series. Uh, but we look forward to to restarting in the fall uh, and continuing this dialogue. Uh, we're going through our own reckoning, and we're using this space to sort of think about how are we making the shifts and what do we need to do to really lead into uh, adjusted recovery as you've already heard. And so uh, this has been um, an amazing process for us and we're gonna continue to learn from it. And, and I'm really glad that we had a chance uh, to start this process. And so we'll be uh, rejoining you very soon. And I do hope that folks get to uh, relax uh, during the summer, find times to, uh, to do some restorative practice because we do need to practice self-care. And we know that folks have been engaged in plugged in and tuned in for more than a year now during this pandemic. And I think it's really important that we practice self-care during the summer. 
beautifully said. Well, we'll look forward to um, the next conversation and thank you again. Um, thanks to all the listeners, thanks to all the panelists. Until next time, be well, everybody. Thank you.